And I do want to get back to the latest details out of the Middle East right now. That is a live look over Haifa in Israel as Israel is preparing for an impending attack by Iran. And at the same time, the U.S. working to combat its own problems with Tehran. A major tech company revealing Iran is targeting the American presidential election with cyber attacks and fake news. In a new report, Microsoft says hackers linked to Iran's Revolutionary Guard targeted a high-ranking official at an unnamed U.S. presidential campaign in a phishing attack and tried to log into the account of a former presidential candidate. The company's report states Iranian actors have spent months creating fake news sites and impersonating activists laying the groundwork to cause division and sway American voters, especially in the swing states. Microsoft details go beyond anything that U.S. intelligence has ever disclosed, giving specific examples Examples of Iranian groups and the actions they've taken. That is just one of the latest developments, and I do want to talk about it all. So let's bring in a friend of the show here, Ben and Ben Talablu, senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thank you so much, as always, for taking the time to be here with us today. Great to be with you, Josh. Good morning. Good morning. Well, first off, I do want to talk to you about this Iranian cyber attack situation. The information that we know is coming in from a report released by Microsoft on Friday. Is that any surprise that Iran could potentially be trying to influence the U.S. election? It's a great question. Unfortunately, it's no surprise, but what it is is, in fact, quite damning, particularly uh, how far they attempted to go with the email phishing bit that you mentioned, trying to get into the account or try to feign or use the credentials to log into uh, the account of even a former candidate uh, for president of the United States. This most recent story, uh, speaking about the actions of Microsoft's, I think, Threat Action Network Center, uh, it's basically the one that monitors um, uh, internet safety for them here, um, has talked about email phishing, account spoofing, uh, and tons of websites with disinformation and misinformation being pushed to, to basically act as uh, real news sites to push not just narrative, but to push invective and misinformation into the hands of American voters. Uh, as you know, this story builds on something that we may have been discussing, um, I think about two or three weeks ago, which is that the preference of the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, to not have President Trump return to the presidency uh, in 2025 uh, what this one shows is that the regime is also going back to some of its tried and true tactics from 2018 and 2019, when Facebook and Microsoft then identified a rise uh, in account spoofing and also a rise in website creation designed to amplify certain narratives because they believe they correlated with a certain foreign policy disposition. And what they're touching on are race issues, are domestic issues, are economic issues, and even uh, kind of the future of American foreign policy issues. Because when Americans fight each other, whether from the left to the right or the right to the left, it's the Ayatollahs, it's Putin, it's the CCP who wins. It sounds as though Iran does not want former President Trump to be reelected. Why might that be the case? Well, that, in my view, that's certainly the case at the systemic level, meaning post-2025, they don't want that. But you've also seen them try to uh, drive to the right to spoof accounts there uh, as well. So no side of the American political system uh, is immune to the kind of uh, tactics and tradecraft that we're seeing from persistent threat actors tied to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and their hackers for hire. Uh, but to the, the big political question, it's absolutely because there is a huge contrast drawn between President Trump and the Democrat that came before him on Iran policy, President Obama, and the Democrat that came after him, who is the current U.S. president, and that's President Joe Biden. Uh, the president, in about a year and a half time, was able to recreate the same macroeconomic damage that about a decade of multilateral sanctions took. Former President Trump killed the regime's uh, chief terrorist, Qasem Soleimani. Uh, this is a huge psychological blow. Uh, that the regime is yet to cover from. President Trump broke uh, something of a ta taboo in Washington, ended a decade-long uh, debate in this town about designating the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in its entirety as a terrorist organization. Now even Canada has done that as well. Um, and, and perhaps most importantly, in the various iterations of uh, boom and bust cycles of Iranian protests, President Trump also broke a major taboo about standing with the Iranian people. He proved that that would not be the kiss of death. And for all of these, and I think many other reasons as it relates to regional security, let alone track record on the nuclear issue, the regime does not want someone who has been touting maximum pressure and maximum support to be back in the White House.
And what you're looking at there on the left side of your screen is a live look over Haifa in Israel, one of the cities there that, of course, is on alert and has been now for more than a week, concerned that Iran is going to launch a major attack on Israel. A lot of folks, a lot of experts have said that that attack is, quote unquote, imminent. Does that, in your expert opinion, appear to still be the case? It, I do believe it is imminent, uh, but lest we forget the distance between when the regime had one of its assets last attack in Syria uh, in April 1st. It took about 12, 13 days for the regime uh, to you know, coordinate the logistics and telegraph the messages that it want to, and it responded militarily on April 13th and April 14th. Uh, if you take the same timeline, that means the attack can come within the next two to three days. Uh, but that's not any kind of a prediction. That's just using uh, the past trend line. The regime also would be seen as preparing to take some of these actions, you know, taking missiles out of storage, moving uh, rail launchers and transporter erector launchers all around the country, uh, moving drones around, uh, perhaps increased communications activity. Uh, these are all things that at least you intelligence could pick up or from a satellite perspective uh, could detect. But I do believe this is still very much a matter of when and not if even though we know that the Jordanian foreign minister has gone to Iran, that Iranian officials have been ha having regional consultations uh, with some uh, folks in the neighborhood, and that even allegedly uh, Russian President Putin has called for a more limited response by the Iranians and the not targeting of Israeli civilians. One of the things that I've heard a lot, especially over the last days as well, is that many people do believe, U.S. officials, Israeli officials, that it could actually be Hezbollah that does launch a major attack on Israel prior to Iran. We know that Hezbollah is a proxy of Iran. So does that still mean that Iran is attacking, attacking Israel if Hezbollah does? You know, any of the 360 degree, multi-dimensional, multi-layered proxy indirect firepower that the Israeli state has taken is in some way, yes, in my view, attributable to the Islamic Republic of Iran. There is no shortage of Iranian provided weaponry in the region. If you remember, uh, part of the cycle of violence that begat this escalation was the use of a single piece uh, of rocket propelled artillery uh, that killed 12 children in Northern Israel in, in Majnul Shams. That was a basic Iranian uh, artillery rocket uh, nothing too fancy, nothing precision guided, uh, about uh, shorter range, about 10 to 12 uh, kilometers, depending on where it's fired from. This is the kind of stuff that the, that the uh, weaponry that the regime has proliferated into the hands of multiple different actors. So regardless of the direction and regardless of the actor, these are capabilities and threats and cycles of violence brought to you by the Islamic Republic. And it's important to be able to attribute that to the source so that proper policy can be made. We've heard about some weapons transfers involving Iran and Russia, a lot of stories about that that have been circulating over the past really several days here. What do we know about the, I guess, validity of all of that? Because Iran has come out and said that's not what's happening, but we know Iran isn't necessarily going to tell the truth about that. So what do we know? You know, potentially, Josh, what we've seen since the erosion of the 2020 arms embargo and 2023 missile testing, missile transfer prohibitions, both of which were uh, at the UN level and could have been stopped from lapsing. And what we know is that the Islamic Republic has actually been more overt about its weapons transfers. And in fact, you're seeing an evolution right now from a state that has been proliferating weapon systems to non-state actors to a state that is interested in transferring or selling weapon systems to state actors. Uh, you know, Iranian drones right now can be found on four different continents. That's that's a bit of a game changer, if you ask me. There's an Iranian element in many of these conflicts, be it Sudan, Ethiopia, Venezuela, and some even allege North Korea, let alone the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, what we hear about the specific missile element of the transfer uh, is that this was the other shoe waiting to drop since 2022. There was reporting initially back in 2022 that short-range ballistic missiles, these are things that can go up to 1,000 kilometers actually, probably 700 kilometers, uh, would be transferred to Russia. There was no battlefield evidence, there was no intelligence evidence. Um, but then early this year in 2024, Reuters reported that the transfer had gone through. Indeed, still, there was no battlefield evidence and there was no you know, intelligence that was publicized. However, now we're having Reuters uh, in the summer of 2024 say that the transfer of not short-range ballistic missiles, but the transfer of close-range ballistic missiles, that means projectiles that fly under 300 kilometers, uh, is basically going to be imminent. And these are actually the systems that the regime has been using in the region much more so. 
It was actually a close range ballistic missile in the fall of 2022. Uh, that was the first time ever that the Islamic Republic used this to kill an American citizen uh, in northern Iraq. The U.S. has still not responded to that. So these are still very lethal systems, despite having a shorter range. And in my view, uh, if the Russians do get these, this would keep them in the fight longer and offset some of the other uh, precision strike systems like the attackums, like the storm shadow, things that the U.S. and the U.K. has respectively uh, tried to provide the Ukrainians to hold on to their territory as well as push back against where the Russians are occupying their territory. So again, no battlefield evidence, a slightly different kind of system, a slightly different kind of threshold, but is proof that the Islamic Republic for one and a half to two decades now, the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, has been saying it's home to the largest ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East. What this story attests to and what the widening radius of Iranian arms proliferation attests to is that these weapons don't stay in the Middle East. And it would be a mistake to quarantine it or think that it would forever be remained there. There are so many concerns, and this really isn't anything new overall, but concerns about nuclear weapons, things of that nature. And I do want to talk about that Wall Street Journal report that just came out, because essentially what we're hearing and what we have heard over the past several years, maybe even decades, is that Iran is fairly close to being able to develop a, a nuclear weapon. Just based on your expertise, does that appear to be the case? Unfortunately, yes. And when you look at what the regime had in terms of its previous quest to develop a nuclear fait accompli before it was caught in 2002 and 2003. Uh, it has since then layered on a whole host of arguments, excuses, diplomatic agreements, and civilian veneers for a program that was always military in its orientation and in its get-go. And recently, based on what the ODNI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, has been reporting, and prior to that, uh, the kind of media frenzy that Senator Graham uh, had created last week pointing to this evolving threat assessment that is kind of operating in the background here by the Director of National Intelligence is that the U.S. intelligence community isn't coming out with the same level of linguistic certitude that the regime is not moving towards a nuclear weapons capability. Uh, they have rolled back some of that language, and instead they have brought forward examples or evidence of knowledge-based nuclear activities, whether that's enrichment at higher levels, stockpiling different quantities, using more advanced centrifuges, tunneling deeper, you name it. These are basically the ingredients that go into a larger cocktail that we call a nuclear weapons program. And for too long, I think, in my view, the fiction of the debate of the 2015 Iran nuclear deal that, oh, no, this has always been civilian, or, oh, no, that diplomacy can nullify this, uh, has been operating in the background. And now as we're talking about evolving Iranian weapons capabilities, we're talking about the regime once again about to fire ballistic missiles, weapons of war, weapons that could potentially carry even a nuclear warhead uh, at the Jewish state. We need to put our eyes on this threat that's been inching along in the background, particularly because we have some drama right now in Democratic Party politics between the switch with President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, with Kamala now being the top of the ticket. Um, for the, the, the DNC that we're about to go into, the Democratic National Convention, as well as the regime thinking that America might be distracted either with the convention or either with the election between November, between now and November, or with the lame duck period, November to January, to move forward and make more critical advances. So in my view, the regime is on the cusp of being a threshold uh, capacity state. And that's why this year you've had multiple Iranian officials talk about this being a capability that uh, they could uh, move towards at a time of their choosing, that this is really a matter of political will, not lack of technical uh, capability. Ben and Ben Talablu, I feel like I could talk to you forever because there are so many topics and so many questions, but got to wrap this up, of course. Is there anything else that you want to add before I let you go? I would just say you keep your eyes on this larger evolving Iran-Israel war. There's something very dangerous here. And this thesis is what the regime is pushing, which is that it can now engage in a limited war, a limited war directly against Israel, a limited war indirectly via proxies, and even a limited war indirectly uh, against America, while preventing you, America, Israel, whoever, from engaging in a limited war against it. And now that we're on the cusp of a potentially second overt, direct, kinetic uh, attack from Iran against Israel, it shows that the policy that we've had that led us to this point, in my view, has been a failure. All right. Thank you again for being here with us today. As always, we really appreciate it. Thank you.